Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, a very biased collection as usual. And um, today I would like to talk about a magic square, and maybe not a magic square in the classical sense of the word of a magic square, but like, um, well, we'll see. It's still a square, but it's not in the sense of a magic square of a duo or something. Uh, so we have to fill in numbers and they sort of satisfy a certain addition and sometimes whatever kind of constraints. Um, no, it's something very different. And I really like it a lot. I'm trying to motivate it. Um, it's really about exceptional. So exceptional things is always like, well, it's kind of a little bit hard to say. Um, so usually I would think that's like really exciting. Um, so if you have something that doesn't fit into the norm, that's like really exciting. And in mathematics, it, it tends to get really exciting. And some, some, sometimes you just need to work along the norm. You just need to fit into the norm. But whenever you have the, the chance to uh, well, observe or dive into something exceptional or you're being exceptional yourself, um, that's just really, really exciting. And today is kind of a, well, it's kind of the opposite in some sense. I'm going to explain that all the exceptional or whatever, the, all the exceptional V algebras, they actually come from the same construction. So in some sense, they're not that exceptional. Uh, but it's still very satisfying. So the octonians will make an appearance. Um, if you want to check out the Octonians, well, just in my last video, I tried to explain what they are. They're kind of an exceptional type of object. Okay, let me try to motivate the story. So very early on, like in 1825-ish, um, there was a Birds of Galois theory, 1825, 20, 30, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, the Birds of Galois theory, which is really the idea of that summon, the, the the roots of polynomials have a certain type of symmetry, and the groups that act on those roots, the, the Galois groups, if you want, they're just really important. And this kind of opens the study of finite groups because the groups, the, the symmetry groups of polynomial equations are finite groups, like almost all of the time in the, in the reasonable setting. And a little bit later, people thought about, okay, if we're kind of looking about symmetries of polynomials and we get an interesting theory, Maybe we should look on, on symmetries of more difficult objects, like con more, more continuous type object, a power series or something. And if you look at the symmetries of, well, differential equations, you end up with a notion of a Lie group. So named after the Norwegian mathematician Lie, uh, not Lie, Lie, uh, Lie group. And it, it's really just a continuous version of, of the finite group. It's kind of like, Whatever finite groups play for Galois theory, Lie groups should play for differential equations, symmetries of differential equations. And there's a funny way. So it's now a, a smooth object. There's some smooth structure you can do calculus on. That. Okay. I'm not going to explain how. It doesn't really matter here. Um, but you can do calculus on that. In particular, you could form like a tangent along a point. It turns out that the tangent itself like the first order approximation, right? The tangent is like the first order approximation on your curve. Uh, so I think about the lead group G as being like a, a smooth type object, like a sphere, and it's Lie algebra small g is like the first order approximation, the tangent, and you can and you can uh, put uh, along uh, on on the smooth object. So first order approximation play a huge role if you just remember calculus. Tangents play a huge role. And it turns out that in Lie theory, which is such, let's let me just say Lie theory is the study of Lie groups and the algebras, which kind of here makes sense, right? It's the study of Lie groups and the algebras. Um, it turns out that for most purposes, for a lot of purposes, maybe that's what I should say, these first order approximation, these Lie algebras are really kind of enough. And they're like, like easier, they're now linear objects, right? There's like a tangent space instead of just a smooth object. And yeah, for an example you should keep in mind is if you take SL2, that's a Lie group. It's a group of two by two matrices with determinant one. So the condition here would be determinant one. It's Lie algebra given, essentially given by a, a, an exponential formula. That's how you get from one to the other. You kind of take a derivative, right? And we get to, to go from the tangent to the real function, you take an integral. To go from the function to the tangent, you take a derivative. Same here. Um, but anyway, you end up with this, usually the algebras are denoted by the 
German mass frac um, and get again two by two matrices, but the condition changes because it, it, you essentially do this operation here. The condition changes to trace beams. Here. So that's an example of a Lie group, some matrix group. That's what you should think. Some matrix group and some the algebra, some derivation of that matrix. Okay. And it, there's a natural question that comes up. Um, can you classify those? That's kind of the question you always ask in mathematics. Can you can you classify these guys? So can you classify the algebra? The algebra is a little bit easier, so maybe let's focus on the algebra, right? So tangent spaces, two Lie groups, um, in a certain type of sense. The simple ones, the elements of the theory, right? So can we classify the elements of Lie theory? Okay. Turns out that Lie was essentially already able to do that. So there's a certain natural families which you kind of immediately write down, and they're encoded by certain graphs. And there's this type of family, which is, which is almost infinite, so they depend on a parameter n. So the n nodes in those diagrams, and they're infinitely many, and they correspond to, well, the, the easiest candidates you write down, if you think about matrix groups, if you think about matrix groups, you have the easiest possible matrix groups, the first thing you would write down is something like a special linear group, uh, an orthogonal group, or a special orthogonal group, or a symplectic group. So either special linear, or you have some form, orthogonal or symplectic. And they correspond, they, they give you the infinite families, essentially every every element of this form. So you get uh, those infinite families, which are, as, as I said, just I encoded by graphs or just symbols A, B, C, D. Okay. And then it turns out that they are, that this is almost it. This is almost it, and there are only a certain number of exceptions. So uh, everything comes in those infinite family except for five exceptions. So there are five matrix groups, they're a little bit strange. So we, I like to think of them as matrix group there, but they're a bit strange. But anyway, and they come up, uh, just pop up random. And they're usually really interesting. As I said, exceptional things are interesting. So you have infinite families given by the natural solutions, if you want. And then you have those um, things turning up, which are, yeah, well, uh, kind of pop up, pop up, just pop up. And <laughs> you can't do anything, they're just there. Um, and it turns out that we have those weird exceptions. And then the essential question is, okay, the, the infinite families, sure, the natural, I call the natural families, they're kind of, yeah. So that's what you would write down, fine. Um, but eventually you need to ask the question, where do, do our weird friends come from? Is there any reason why they pop up? Um, maybe you should explore that. Maybe there's some interesting mathematics, physics, whatever going on. Uh, so we should kind of dig deeper. And there are like many answers. And here's one that I find very, very pleasant. So it constructs all of them from just one from just one exceptional object, namely from the quaternions. Uh, it's one square to find them all, right? <laughs> whatever. Um, so this is called Freudenthal's Freudenthal tits, whatever, Freudenthal's metric square. And I will explain it in a second, but essentially you have two inputs, uh, which are those division algebra, so real numbers, complex numbers, uh, the quaternions or the octonions, and you have another input to so A and B, and you get the square. Depending on what you put in, you get a certain type of Lie algebra. So here, the SL2, a boring one. This is SL3, this is boring. Here, this, this is again boring. So all of these, well, maybe it's a bit easier to do it like this. Everything that comes up if you don't use the octonions is like of one of the classical ones in a small, small dimension. A5 could be something like SL6. Yeah. So here, our little A5 diagram, SL6. And D6 is one of the orthogonal. And then you put in the octonians, and you see F, E, E, and E. So it looks like you're only missing G2. Let's go back. So from this square, you will get this one. This is a really bad color. Let me try again. Maybe this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And this one actually also appears, but in a slightly different construction. So it's an automorphism group of the octonians, right? So the octonians create all exceptional Lie types. You can really just spot on create the Lie algebras from uh, the octonians. So as I said, G2 doesn't quite fit into this little square here. Uh, only the other exceptional ones fit into this little square. And yeah, G2 doesn't. Note the symmetry, it's symmetric. So, um, so here's A5 and here's A5, for example. Is A7, is E7. But anyway, so you get the exceptional ones from the octonians. 
And the construction is actually pretty straightforward. You can do, define a Lie algebra using uh, derivatives, uh, the, the, the derivations, and a certain type of algebra, which is called the draw algebra. But anyway, so you get this table. And here, as I said, all of these are kind of classical. Um, so depending on your convention, you can either write SL or SU, special unitary or special linear. That doesn't make any difference. So here's the one I said uh, before. It doesn't make any difference for what I'm going to say. They're so different, but it doesn't make any difference for what I'm going to say. So here's SU6, and then what I was calling before uh, SL6, I guess. Um, and then here are the exceptions. So they all turn up for the octonians. And note that as soon as you stick in one being the octonians, so here you have A and B, A and B, as soon as you stick in one being the octonians, um, you always get one of the exceptional ones, which I find really exciting because now you get all exceptional types from the octonians if you just keep in mind that G2, uh, the remaining funny type, essentially appears, no, not essentially, appears in automorphisms already. And the others appear uh, via this construction. So there's actually, it's actually only one exceptional object, which is the octonians. It's kind of a fun, kind of a fun way uh, of theory. this. And this is called Freudenthal's magic square. And this is the Freudenthal uh, Tietz construction. Um, Tietz, whatever. Tietz, I think, is the pronunciation. So whatever it is, um, it's kind of a base. As soon as it's written down, it's not really, really difficult to verify. But of course, it's pretty brilliant to construct uh, those algebras out of um, out of uh, the octonians. And here, actually, in this little table where uh, you also have the derivations of A over B, you will find our little friend G2 as well. So if you want to just put it in into the same uh, square. And this is kind of fantastic because the octonians in the end are really just constructed from the Fano plane. So in some sense, the Fano plane is the exceptional object, uh, which I kind of find uh, very interesting because it's like the easiest uh, finite projective plane and it turns up everywhere for some some funny funny reason. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video uh, trying to explain where the exceptional Lie algebras come, come, came from, come from, whatever. There are many ways of constructing them. This is just one of my favorites because it just uses essentially the Fano plane or maybe more formally speaking, Nocturnus. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.